Okay, we're live. Five, four, three, two, one. Committee on Community Development, Tuesday, July 28th, 2020. Councilmember Glombeck? Here. Councilmember Rivera? Present. Councilmember Scanlon? Councilmember Wyatt? Councilmember Bowman? Here. And Council President Pritchett is joining us. And Councilmember Wingo was here. Councilmember Wingo. Quorum is present. Okay, from the top, please. Item number one, permission to enter into a designated developer agreement for various lots in the fruit belt. Items open. Okay, this item is open. Um, can't see, is Mr. Pridgen here? Yes, sir. Um, yeah, I'm assuming you want to speak on that. Um, the I believe uh, India is on, and Mr. Chair, you could just turn it over to her, and I'll speak at the end. Okay. Um, India, you can start. Sure. And just say your full name for the record, please. My name is India Walton, W-A-L-T-O-N. I am the Executive Director of the Fruit Belt Community Land Trust. I am also joined today by Mr. Robert Noor Esquire, who is our board secretary. Um, we're excited um, at the prospect of being able to enter into a designated developer agreement with the city um, for approximately 27 parcels on which um, in collaboration with our community partners and community members, we will build 50 units of permanently affordable housing. Um, so if you have any specific questions, I'm here to answer those, but also because we believe in very deep community engagement processes, we have not begun to design what buildings would look like. We do have a general indication of what the mix of units will look like and have begun developing a site plan, but we don't have any specifics regarding design because we really want that to come straight from um, our community members. Mr. Chair, um, as, as you know, whenever a designated developer, um, a person who wants designated developer status and elegant, I bring them right from the beginning to uh, this council. I am familiar. Uh, with Ms. Walton and definitely with Mr. Knorr. Um, uh, Mr. Knorr is a very capable of, of helping in this project. Um, I know he's on the board, I believe. So he's there on, on your board. Is that right, India? Um, and so, Mr. Chair, um, just several things that I'll say very quickly. Um, I'm very, very excited um, to um, move that that this um, be approved. And I'll, I'll tell you why. This, these are people from the community. Uh, India grew up in the community. She has been an active part. This is not a developer coming in from outside, although I'm not saying that that's a bad thing, but I'm saying that this will be another homegrown project um, in the Fruit Belt from people who wanted what is known as a land trust. And I said this in uh, the, the council meeting, I didn't totally understand it in the beginning. And she beat me over the head with a bat until I did. Um, and Buffalo has finally a land trust, not the first one, but the first land trust did not work well, according to council member Franzak when he was with us. This one is working. It has community support. Um, and uh, the reason I usually bring designated developers before us is to say these words that I don't have to say to this group. And that is community, community, community. Engage the community. And I know that they get it because of the statements that were just made that we don't even have a design. We want to talk to the community. And so I know that they get it. Um, and so I can be brief in my remarks and ask that this be approved. Motion to approve. Motion is to approve, seconded by Council President Pridgen. Item number two, crisis services, recommendation and guidance for assisting Buffalo Police Department with mental health issues. Items open. Uh, the item is open and we have a representative here to speak on this, I believe. Yes, Mr. Chair, we are joined by my esteemed former colleagues, Jessica Pirro and Tracy from Crisis Services. Okay, welcome, welcome. Just state your name uh, when you speak for the record, please. Uh, this is Jessica Pirro. Um, I'm the CEO of Crisis Services. 
And I'm Tracy Boosie. I'm the Director of Emergency Mental Health Response Services at Crisis Services. Thank you so much for the opportunity to have a few minutes of your time today. Um, we were invited to just speak with you um, today regarding the letter we had submitted a week ago or so about the role crisis services currently plays and can continue to play um, in helping uh, the Buffalo Police Department in their response and dealing with mental health um, calls as well as training and other areas of diversion that could be extremely helpful during this time as you're looking at police reform. Uh, our letter provided a variety of uh, information about our organization. We are the 24-hour crisis center for this community, uh, 52 years um, in uh, service to Buffalo and Erie County, um, but also have been very involved in crisis response work through our mobile outreach program and our 24-hour hotline program. Uh, we do believe there's opportunity that we can explore with the city um, and provided a couple different ideas through um, supporting enhancing existing services as well as some other diversionary um, opportunities that really could help um, direct these types of calls from law enforcement, um, even from 911 to uh, the crisis center is to help really get people directed into behavioral health and mental health care at the crisis moment uh, when they might be contacting law enforcement. So we were here to see if there's any questions that you had, um, just wanted to be able to speak to anything that you uh, maybe had to the letter we had submitted. Okay, uh, any of my colleagues have any questions? Uh, Mr. Wingo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I uh, wanna just thank, um, Jessica, for writing that five-page letter to the Common Council, advising us of all of the great work that they are engaged in, we do understand that there is a need to have professional mental health workers on the front lines working uh, right in tandem with our Buffalo Police Department to ensure that folks with mental health issues are treated with the dignity and respect that every human uh, deserves. I really want to say thank you, Tracy. Thank you, Jessica, and all the hardworking individuals who work with you alongside the work that you do. Now, the 7,000 calls that you all take basically per month, um, I remember reading the letter, and, and things might be a little bit fuzzy now, but uh, I know you had, you answer about 7,000 calls per month. And um, those calls that you receive, who are they primarily from? And what is the, uh, the, the, the majority of those uh, uh, phone calls? What, what is the nature of the majority of those phone calls? So as the 24-Hour Crisis Center, there's a variety of issues that our hotline um, uh, manages. Uh, we also have very uh, dedicated focuses on our hotline. Um, in addition to general crisis, uh, we are, you know, have specialty areas in mental health, addiction, rape, domestic violence, and just general trauma response um, to the work that we do. So those 7,000 calls are a combination of those types of issues. Somebody could be calling a suicidal, so a family member could be calling with a loved one dealing with an addiction. Um, it could be a victim of domestic violence looking for safety and shelter. Um, it could be somebody that was just assaulted um, and looking for support. And it could just be somebody that's looking to manage through exactly what we're all dealing with right now. We have seen definitely an impact to our hotline of individuals reaching out for supportive counseling to manage through the anxieties and kind of the unexpected experiences we're dealing with um, with the COVID pandemic. Um, so our hotline is really, we're available 24 seven, we're helping our community members um, in their time of need, um, but we also are experts in crisis response and being able to then determine what's the best, best next level of care that that person might need and really helping to divert from unnecessary higher levels of care, unnecessary hospitalization, as well as unnecessary jail um, presentations in certain situations mm -hmm. as well. Wonderful. Uh, now, uh, the hotline, uh, how does an individual become aware of the hotline? And w I would like to really help with, you know, uh, promulgating your message, of course, of which we have a newsletter where we can help disseminate that information. What is the phone number, the hotline that people can call? And also, I was talking about this earlier regarding the uh, diversion of 911 uh, calls to crisis services. And after that, the follow-up question is going to be your CIT program, just so you know mentally where I'm about to go with this. But uh, what is that number that folks can can call or reach out to? So 
So the crisis hotline uh, is 24 hours a day is 834-3131. And um, that, you know, so anybody can call that hotline. Um, how that is, is messaged out to the community happens in various forms from our own marketing kind of grassroots efforts of getting the message out from partner agencies, from law enforcement, from the hospitals. Uh, many of our partner agencies are also encouraging people to utilize the hotline when they are in need because we are 24 seven, that we're always here. Um, so a lot of our messaging comes from word of mouth, uh, messaging through marketing, um, advertising, um, as well as just being very integrated in the behavioral health system. We are part of people's crisis plans, part of their safety plans, mm -hmm. uh, part of those referral processes when they are connected in services or present for an emergency service they know that the hotline is always going to be available to them. And that's usually incorporated into those types of discharge plans. Now we've had a lot of talk lately of um, our crisis intervention team with the Buffalo police department. Now, uh, again, like I said, my memory is a little fuzzy regarding the information that you had uh, written in the letter of which of course, like I stated earlier, I'm very appreciative mm -hmm. of, uh, cause a lot of people did not know that you all have this role in, in, in such a, I should say vast role and, and crisis services and crisis intervention, but uh, can you please explain to the, the great citizens of Buffalo as well as my colleagues as to what your role is with the crisis intervention team? I, I can answer that. I can answer that a bit. Um, that's in my wheelhouse a bit here. Um, we are the sole provider of crisis intervention team training. Please state your name for the record. Yep. Tracy Boosie, crisis okay. services. Okay, gotcha. Um, we're the sole provider of CIT training for Erie County. So we have been training officers um, since 2013 and uh, about 600 officers across Erie County have been trained in this model. Uh, about 131, I think is the magic number from Buffalo right now. And this allows them to have um, a specialized group of officers that can respond when a call goes into dispatch that appears to feel like a mental health issue to the dispatcher. So they can request that a CIT officer then is, um, is sent out into the field rather than a regular patrol officer. This training looks at everything from mental illness to de-escalation to empathy and communication, de-escalation techniques, suicide prevention and assessment. It really covers the gamut so that, so that they have a group of officers that are trained to be able to assist in those situations and be able to bring in mental health resources such as our teams. In addition, that's that's wonderful. Now, um, as far as the, the the police and the crisis intervention team, uh, Tracy. Um, so since 2013, we've trained about well, the magic number is 131 of over 600. That's less than a, a quarter of all of the folks. Is there any reason in particular that you can help shed light on as to why the Buffalo Police? has only gotten that number of people trained, uh, police officers trained so far? I know they, um, I don't wanna to speak totally on their behalf, but I know that they've had issues in terms of the cost of releasing officers um, to get the training. So while the, the training is free, and particularly right now it's free, we're on a five-year SAMHSA grant that allows us to deliver this completely free of charge to officers. So, there so are, wait, they have wait. to backfill oh, shifts. Tracy, I'm sorry, wait a minute, back over. Oh, oh. yeah. <laughs> I'm sorry. So. You just said the training is free? The training is free from our right. end, yes. So anyone could get this training? Any or officer in Erie County can enroll in this training. There is no cost for them to attend the training, but there are backfilling costs we understand in the departments to be able to release people to attend the week-long training. Okay, 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 okay. So it's a week-long training. How many hours per day is this training? Tracy. Uh, it's four eight-hour days, and then there is an eight-hour day that can be done at a later point where it is some shadowing within our mobile outreach department so mm -hmm. that they can get out in the field with some mental health professionals. So it's a total of 40 hours. Okay, so, okay, 40 hours. That's an intense training, and that's some real mm -hmm. training. I, okay, yep. I understand. Okay. Thank you, uh, Tracy, uh, Jessica. You're Thank you both for coming in today and explaining this. I really appreciate the work that you do with the um, – through, through what you do as far as the professionals. I try to tell people all the time, we cannot relegate what you do to just a training and then call them, you know, no, you guys are the professionals. You all are the experts. And I want you to know that I acknowledge your expertise in this field and never will I ever try to mitigate or downplay uh, the work that you do 
in the community as it relates to those folks who need you because you have a special kind of work as well. I mean, you guys are are, are heroes in my book. You have a special, very special kind of work. You uh, all exhibit the kind of patience that a lot of people I wish they they had, but um, you all are, are superheroes to me. Uh, anyone who works in the medical field, but especially those folks who work in the mental health, when you can't literally physically always see what's wrong with the person, but you, because of your experience and because of how you've uh, and educated yourself, you all know uh, exactly what to do. So I appreciate the work that you all do in the community. And uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, for the time. Appreciate it. Okay. No, thank you. I want to echo uh, Council Member uh, Wingo's sentiments as well. Um, I think that, you know, one of the biggest problems that we have, and I can just tell you from anecdotal uh, um, uh, evidence, uh, we had a cleanup a couple of weeks ago, and uh, I was, um, we were, we had a pile in a certain spot in the neighborhood and this guy kept riding by me on his bike and he was staring at me and finally came up to me and started screaming at me um, that I wasn't supposed to be, you know, putting garbage uh, in a public park. And he was absolutely right. And so I, I, I was a high school social studies teacher. I was somewhat trained to deal with people in certain agitated situations. Um, but uh, this man, you know, you could tell that he had some some issues, and I was glad that he actually confronted me. I mean, it wasn't uh, in a, a nasty confrontational physical sort of a way, but um, it was uncomfortable, and I explained to him who I was, and he kept yelling at me and yelling at me, and I remember sitting there and thinking that, you know, this is why you need people that are professionals to deal with situations like this, because, I mean, I'm pretty mellow by nature and I wasn't, I certainly wasn't upset with the man and I was actually glad that he asked who I was and why I was doing that. But, you know, you put somebody in there that's a hothead and, you know, whether it's a police officer or a teacher or, you know, anybody and it can just lead to, you know, bigger problems. So I do think that the importance of training and, um, you know, to some of us, it seems like common sense, but, you know, to many people, it's not. And so I, I want to commend you and thank you uh, as well. Thank you. Uh, yeah. Going back to, oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, going back to Mr. Wingo and then Mr. Nolkowski. Okay, I don't, want, I, want to, I, don't, I don't want to take up too much more time, but I do have this question just popped in my head as you were talking, uh, Council Member um, I don't know who will answer this, Jessica or Tracy, but what other agency? What other agencies? Uh, I know that there's more than just crisis services. What other agencies are working alongside uh, Buffalo Police Department, and exactly what are their roles in comparison to your roles? So that there's not to say some uh, thought of duplication of of, of 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 work here. Well, from what we on the mental health side, and I just want to note too, we have a longstanding history with Buffalo Police and doing co-located services for the Special Victims Unit and have been doing that um, since the early 90s for victims of domestic and sexual violence. And our mobile outreach program has been around since the 80s. So we've been working hand in hand with, with Buffalo PD. Um, in regards to response services, um, the, other, the only other agency I know, there's a, a recent um, development um, with Ende Endeavor Health Services. So I know that they're in the process of working with Captain Byers to establish that process um, of follow-up case management support services, which is, which is different from the crisis response work that we do. Um, but there's also a lot of other agencies I know in the community that the police are aware of that make referrals at the DCMC, um, if there's homeless issues, other things. So law enforcement and part of that CIT training that Tracy mentioned as well does also speak to some of these other issues that law enforcement tends to interface with um, on a call so that they know what is the right place to go, where are referrals that can be made especially in that moment of that crisis response that law enforcement deals with. Um, so in regards to other like co-located services or agencies, I'm not aware, I don't know, Tracy, if you can speak further to that, but we just know of the recent development with Endeavor, which we're in communication with Captain Byer and um, their executive director at Endeavor about kind of how this process will work and how those handoffs will happen. Um, as we will be involved at the crisis level. Um, it's also important to note that we are partnered with um, ECMC um, as well. And uh, we also have a, a certain designation through the Erie County Department of Mental Health 
as uh, designated what I refer to as 945 designated by the mental hygiene law. So similar to what law enforcement has um, under the mental hygiene law for a 941, our organization has a designation um, as a behavioral health provider and the only one that has that um, for adult services. So we would have to be pulled in at various levels at a crisis, depending on the risk of that crisis. Um, and so we really are looking to assure a good seamless um, approach um, and, and really helping to assure there is no duplication. We wanna make sure that it is as seamless as possible, not only for the officer handling that call so that they can respond back into the field, but also that we're getting people into the right services and the right care and really diverting people unnecessarily to care that might be only continuing to, har to harm their recovery or their treatment planning. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, can I, can I add to that quickly? Um, it, I just wanna add that we, we're the, really the only 24 seven service for the 18 right. plus population. So when the police need something after hours, we're it. <laughs> we're the people that are responding. <laughs> well, There's options during the week, but after hours, that's us. You know, and and I, I don't remember which one of my colleagues had brought this up in the past discussions when it came down to the CIT program that was going to be funded, but that was one of the concerns, and that's why I really appreciate uh, the letter that you had all submitted to us so that we could be aware. No, there is there are services that are available 24-7 that you all provide. And that is, that is very, very important. I just wanna make sure that people understood that this was not a duplication of services, that the, the new program is working not in lieu of crisis services, but in tandem. You all are coordinated on your end as to what happens after the police uh, uh, calls for that, that assistance. All right, I'm all done now. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you ladies for joining us. Okay, hey, uh, Mr. Nolkowski. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Tracy, I just have a quick question, uh, two quick questions for you and Jessica, but when does uh, crisis services step in versus what um, we approved a few weeks ago? You could kind of walk us through that. When do we tend to step in in these emergency situations? Yeah, it can happen at a, a bunch of different points, but our hotline really is the main hub into the agency to a variety of services. But if we're talking about the Buffalo Police Department in particular, about 15% of our referrals come directly from police in Erie County. And so they may call in at the time that they are on site already. So they've been called out to um, because somebody called somebody called into dispatch and they needed assistance. Um, we would love to see that that almost backs up a little bit. If you look at some of our recommendations, we feel like we can start to divert some of those calls really at a very much earlier point. <laughs> Let's not wait until the police have to have to be called out. Let's try to divert right from the point of contact with dispatch and can those calls be transferred over? And we've been looking at some models with that for about a year now. And so that's mentioned in the recommendations as one point that we could, we could insert ourselves even sooner. Um, but typically it's when the police have, have reached out because they're already on site. And you know, I thank you for bringing that up because I kind of want to piggyback off of um, what you said about your recommendations. Is there anything that we could streamline for, for better services? that we could streamline immediately. Um, I, I'm not sure if I have an answer to that as to anything that we could do immediately without additional resources into programs. We're always trying to streamline and make sure we have very rapid response um, out into the community. And we, and we do respond very quickly to police in particular. They have a, they have a gateway in and a, and a rapid three minute response time from our teams. Thank you. Okay, is there anybody else that wanted to speak? If not, uh, we can table this. Um, thank you for coming down. Uh, I have a feeling that there's going to be a lot more um, cooperative ventures in the future than we've had in the past. Uh, and I think that it's a good thing long term. Um, so let's, uh, we'll table this uh, seconded by Mr. Scanlon. And thank you once again for coming. Thanks for having us. Thank you very much. No other items. Motion to adjourn. And the motion is to adjourn, seconded uh, by Mr. Bowman.